been doing a, a study in the book of, of Colossians. And uh, boy, for some reason, God led us a different direction tonight. Uh, I know so, uh, Brad's here, he preaches, and God, sometimes God will just lay something on your heart and you don't really know why, um, but, but you follow that. And uh, so I want you to turn to Psalm chapter 23, obviously is a very familiar passage of scripture. We're just going to look at one verse tonight, but um, today even in my office I met with a couple who uh, uh, was dealing with what we're going to talk about tonight, so I thought, well, maybe this was just for them. Well, since I talked to them, two more people ha have come to me and, and shared some things going on in their lives uh, that will go right along with the message tonight. So uh, that's, that's the way the Lord works, and we just uh, try to hear what He tells us. And so we're going we're gonna to talk about the subject of worry. Any worriers here tonight? Worry about things in your life? Well, we're going we're gonna to talk about that tonight. Psalm chapter... 23. Uh, stand with us. We're going to read just one verse. Uh, this chapter is probably the most famous chapters in the book of Psalms, uh, written by uh, the psalmist David. But we're going to look uh, and spend time tonight in verse number two. David says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, He leadeth me beside the still waters. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that uh, no matter what we're going through, there's something in your word that can meet each and every need that we're going through. So, God, I pray that you would do that tonight. We have many here tonight who uh, are battling things in their life. Maybe there are some fear uh, of the unknown, uh, maybe some worry about some situations that no one else knows about. But, God, you've laid us on our heart, and I pray that we can uh, do, do uh, justice, Lord, uh, to what you'll have us say to our folks. We love you. We thank you. Speak to hearts as only your Holy Spirit can. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, are, are you a worrier? You know there was a word that came out uh, years ago. It's called a worry wart. Anybody ever heard of that? Are you a worry wart? Um, has anybody ever wondered where that term came from, by the way? Worry and warts don't go together. So I always so I looked it up seriously uh, in the late 1700s, early 1800s. Uh, that word "wart" is something that uh, is offensive. That really d people don't want to be some around someone full of warts. And so, if you were called a worry wart, what they were saying is, "Get away from me because I don't want what you have." So that's where that word came from—a worry wart. Uh, would you believe that word is in the dictionary? Worry wart is in the dictionary. Webster's Dictionary defines a worry wart as one who is inclined to worry habitually and needlessly. There are people here, maybe even tonight, who may see something on TV, read something in the newspaper, and buddy, they got it, whatever that is. They got this sickness, I got this sickness. They got that symptom, I've got that symptom. I heard about a man who worried so much, all the hair in his wig fell out. <laughs> I've told that joke more than any other joke since I've pastored this church. That joke right there. But are you someone who looks for something to worry about? This past week, I went on the internet and I typed in the words, what we worry about. And I was amazed. I shouldn't have even put it in. There are hundreds of things that came up of, of what Americans worry about. And I was amazed at all the things. There, there were people who are worried over the wrinkles on their face. The ozone. Global warming. Their age. Credit fraud. Road rage. I even found one page, God's honest truth, I found one page that spoke of worrying about deformed frogs. No joke. I ran across an article entitled, Baby Boomers, Back Then and Right Now. It said, Baby Boomers, Back Then, 
getting out to a new hip joint. Baby boomers now, getting a new hip joint. Back then, acid rock. Right now, acid reflux. Back then, long hair. Now, longing for hair. Back then, passing the driving test. Now, passing the vision test. Back then, trying to look like Marlon Brando or Elizabeth Taylor. Right now, trying not to look like Marlon Brando or Elizabeth Taylor. But you name it, and we worry about it. Yet, you know, our Bible talks exactly about this problem in our lives. I think of what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 27. He says, which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Those words, taking thought, speak of worrying about different things. Jesus said, worrying never added one inch to your height or one day to your life. That all our worrying never helped one thing. Someone has said this, and I love this. He said, worrying is like rocking in a rocking chair. It'll give you something to do, but it won't get you anywhere. Amen? Worry never eliminates your problem, ever. It only enlarges your problem. And as we look at Psalm 23 tonight, we are reminded that worry is not only useless, it is needless in the life of a Christian. I mean, we talk about things that are fat-free and interest-free and sugar-free, but verse 2 is going to tell us that we can live life worry-free if you only let God work. Instead of living a worried-filled life, full of fear, full of anxiety, we can live a worry-free life. So let's notice these words in verse number 2. And let's learn about facing the days that are ahead of us worry-free. First thing I want us to consider tonight, I, I want you to notice in verse number 2, the depiction of a restful life. I want you to notice the position of these sheep here in verse number 2. It's very enlightening. David describes this flock of sheep as lying in green pastures. Now, Philip Keller, who wrote the very famous book on Psalm 23, made an interesting observation about sheep. He writes this. He said, the strange thing about sheep is that because of their makeup, it is almost impossible for them to be made to lie down unless four requirements are met. He said, number one, they refuse to lie down unless they are free of all fear. He said, number two, because of their social behavior within a flock, sheep will not lie down unless they are free from friction with other sheep of their own kind. He said, number three, if tormented by flies or parasites, sheep will not lie down. Only when they're free of these pests can they relax. And then fourthly, he said, sheep will not lie down as long as they feel in need of finding food. He said, they must be free from hunger. So for sheep to lie down, everything must be just right. No predators to frighten them, no bugs in the air to aggravate them, no empty stomachs, no friction with other sheep. Everything has to be just so. Yet when we look at these sheep here in verse number 2, lying in green pastures, we see sheep that are undisturbed by the things that would normally disturb them. See that word, lie down? It literally means to couch, is the word. It speaks of legs folded under the sheep. The picture given here is, is of the sheep lying there with their four legs folded under them, nestled in the green grass of the pasture, seemingly without a care in the world. And these sheep are a perfect picture of a worry-free life. And we see this in two ways with these sheep. First, we see these sheep are undisturbed by the perplexities of life. See, there, there are many things that can agitate the sheep, making them restless. There are wild dogs out there. There are wolves and, and bears. There's other wild prey that can stalk and hunt them. 
There are also the insects that make them restless and agitated. But when you look at these sheep described in our text, we see sheep that are undisturbed by these things. Understand, for the believer, there are going to come things in this life that try to worry you. There will come situations in your life that will cause distress, that will cause disturbance, that will cause discomfort. And all of these things I call the the perplexities of life, the uncertainties of life. And unfortunately, these things cause us to worry. We worry about how we're going to make ends meet. We worry about the the next house payment or car payment. We we worry, is our job going to hold out? We worry about our children. Are they safe? We worry about our our health. Are we going to be okay? And we worry about this and we worry about that. And and the list of things that cause us to worry is by no means a, a, a small thing. But please understand that this picture of These sheep lying in green pastures, it's not a picture that suggests that all the things that could cause them to worry have been eliminated from their life. No, not at all. Listen, the wild boars and the wild wolves and bears, they're still out there somewhere. The danger still exists. The bugs and flies that worry them, they've not been put on the endangered species list. They're still there. By the way, did anybody notice the pesky love bugs have returned to the state of Florida? But however, in this scene, the sheep are not worried about these things. They're of no concern to them at the present. So the Bible says they relax and they lie down. So we see the words to lie and to lie down, but then notice the phrase in green pastures. I love that that picture here. One commentary says these words mean, in pleasant places full of grass, he maketh me relax. In David's time, there were not rolling fields of green pastures or grassy prairies stretching as far as the eye could see. No, David's years as a shepherd would have seen him caring for a flock in the Judean wilderness. Some of you have been there. You know what it looks like? It's very dry. It's a very barren, but it's a very rocky place. Here and there, you might find patches and areas of green grass. But it's not everywhere. So I want you to get this picture in your mind. The shepherd has led them to some shady spot where the tender shoots of grass are springing up. And those sheep come and they lie there content and worry-free. Yet all around them, as far as the eye can see, is a parched and barren land. But guess what? The sheep are not affected by the conditions around them. Their shepherd brought them to this green pasture. And there they lie undisturbed by the conditions surrounding them. See, a a worry-free life, it does not mean that all things that cause us to worry, have been eliminated. It's still there. But a worry life, worry-free life, means that we're not disturbed by the conditions and situations all around us. They don't fill our minds. They don't fill our life with anxiety and distress. A worry-free life is one that in spite of what's going on around us, we can be at rest. Instead of chewing our fingernails to the bone, we're munching on green grass and relaxing. So we see they're undisturbed by the perplexities of life. Also, we see in this picture that these sheep are undisturbed by the possibilities of life. Back in Matthew chapter 6, down in verse 34, Jesus said this. He said, take therefore no thought for tomorrow. See, if if most of us were honest, we would admit that most of our worries, most of our fears are about things that are yet to come. Or they're about things that may happen in the future. You see, that word tomorrow is the key word in most of our worries. If we're honest. None of us are afraid, none of us are fearful or, 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 or scared to death of something happening to us right now. You okay right now? Yeah, you're all right. I'm good right now. But it's about next week or next month or that 
next doctor visit or that next appointment in the, the future. See, the story is told that the New Testament scholar, Archbishop Trench, he absolutely became possessed with the fear that the limbs of his body were going to lose all their feeling. He constantly worried about this. And they said one night he was sitting at a, an elaborate state dinner when all of a sudden he blurted out, Oh, it's finally happened. I haven't got a bit of feeling in my right leg. And the lady sitting next to him said, Your grace, if it'll be any comfort to you, that's my leg that you're pinching right now. <laughs> I read of a study done by Dr. Margaret McCourty. She works at a hospital, graduated from University of Wisconsin. Listen to this. She found out that 92% of the things her patients worry about never happen. You hear that number? 92%. When you look at these sheep lying in green pastures, I'm telling you, there are many dangers they could face. There's all kinds of situations they could find themselves in in the days to come, the, the possibilities are numerous. But we don't see them worried one bit about what might happen tomorrow, what might happen the, the next week. No, they're, they're undisturbed by the possibilities of life. And may I say unto you that it is impossible, you hear me, it is impossible to correctly predict what the days ahead have in store for you. So why do we allow the devil, who is called, by the way, the father of liars, why do we allow him tell us what's going to happen in our minds in the future? You do know that the devil does not know what's going to happen in the future. Do you know that? The devil is not omniscient. He does not know. Yet some of us allow him to tell us what's going to happen to us in the future. And we believe it. Corey Tim Boom said, When we worry, we are carrying tomorrow's load with today's strength, and we end up carrying two days in one. And we just can't do it. But in this verse here, we see, first of all, the depiction of a restful life. Number two, we then see the, the deliverance from a fretful life. You ever met someone who, who fretted all the time? Pouted all the time? Something's wrong with them all the time? You meet some people, how are you doing? And buddy, that's the last word you'll ever get out. <laughs> oh, I had this surgery last week. You want to see the scar? No, pull it up. I had my gallstones taken out here. I got them in a bowl. Come here and look at them. Let me show them to you. But when we look at these sheep lying in green pastures, it's obvious that they have been delivered from a life of worry. They are restful. They're not fretful. However, that's not their nature. Philip Keller also writes in his book, he says, It is generally known that sheep are very timid and easily panicked that even a stray jackrabbit suddenly bounding from behind a bush can stampede a whole flock. I met a lot of Christians like those sheep. Doesn't take much to cause us to worry. I think of Sir Walter Scott. They said he had incurred a, a debt of 120,000 pounds, which is an, an extremely large sum in those days. He did heroically dispose of the debt, but it was not without great cost to him mentally, emotionally, and physically. They said he worried so much about the debt that it broke his health. His doctor said to him one day, Sir Walter, if you do not cease worrying about this situation, you will die. Sir Walter Scott looked up with a sad smile and said, Doctor, as long as that debt is hanging over my head, I cannot help but worry. And you know it wasn't two weeks later he dropped over dead. I have heard of worry being described as the silent killer. A fretful life, a worry-filled life affects us in so many ways. For example, studies have found that worry is very damaging to our health. 
Dr. Charles Mayo, the founder of Mayo Clinic, said this. He said, worry affects the circulation. It affects your heart, the glands, and the whole nervous system. Dr. Alexis Carroll gave this warning. He said, those who do not know how to fight worry will die young. Worry affects us physically, emotionally, mentally, and even spiritually. Therefore, we must look at what God says in his word. And he tells us very plainly that the presence of worry, it is condemned. In Matthew 6, 25, again, Jesus says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Isn't that something? Jesus was condemning the presence of worry in our life. Herbert Lockyer said this, When a Christian worries, he is living in the wrong climate, for any kind of worry is foreign to his life in Christ. William Channon is even more condemning of worry. He says, worry is entirely unscriptural. As Christians, we have taken the precepts of the scripture for our standard of living. We look upon the Bible as our final court of appeals in all life's details. So who can deny that within its pages, there is no warrant found for worrying? O.S. Hawkins was straightforward when he wrote, many of us, Assume that God merely looks upon worry with a frown. But the fact is, He strictly forbids it in His Word. In short, worry is wrong. It is condemned by God. When you consider the effects of worry, it's understandably so. So we see the presence of worry is condemned. And we see that the absence of worry is commanded. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, Paul writing, very familiar verse. Obviously, the Philippian church was fearful of some things. So Paul writes them in this letter, and then the fourth chapter... In the sixth verse, he says, be careful for nothing. Now listen, if you mark in your Bible, underline that word careful or circle it. I want you to put this word next to it. Put the word anxious. He says, be anxious for nothing. Or you can put the word worry. He says, don't worry about anything. So what do we do, Paul? But in what? Everything by prayer and supplication. Here's a good one. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Do you notice that? Those words? Be careful for nothing. We are commanded. That is not a suggestion. It is a command for us not to worry. And and please understand, I'm not telling you not to worry just because I'm preaching a sermon about it. It is commanded by God in His Word for you not to worry. I know some of you are thinking that's easier said than done. Let me say to you, God would never command us to do something if it could not be done. If he tells us not to worry, then he's saying it is possible to live a worry-free life rather than a worry-filled life. When we look at these sheep lying in green pastures, we see them delivered from a fretful life. I hate snakes. I hate them. I don't like them. You know, what what Roger say? There's only one kind of snake he likes. What is it? A dead snake, right? I think I was 14 years old. We were living next to Dennis and Alice, and I had the great job of mowing the grass. They only had 125 acres. Now, I didn't have to mow the entire thing, but we mowed up in the front. And I remember I was mowing one time, and it was one of those that you just walk behind, right? You just press the button and, or the, the handle, and you walk behind it. And there was a latch on there that you could latch down that you didn't even have to press. You could let your hand go, and it would just just keep going. 
And I remember we, I was mowing, and all of a sudden I came up, and a snake lifted his head out of a hole. I mean, scared me to death. I started praying, speaking in tongues. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just woke up, about three of you right back there. That snake come out of that hole and just took off. So you know how that the snake slid, just the, the most disgusting thing, just slithering. And you know what I did? I latched that baby up to full power. I pressed that handle, flipped the switch, and it started going. I let it go. I wasn't falling behind it. It is something, I, I've got this huge mower, here's this little snake. If it turned around, I had the idea it was going to conquer that mower and come after me. So I just let it go. And that mower is just hopping along and that snake's moving as fast as it can. That snake takes a right. God as my witness. That mower hit a rock or bump or something and turned right, right behind it. It was awesome. <laughs> I was like... My prayers are working, man. <laughs> and it's falling. It's getting closer. And it's getting closer. I'm watching with anticipation. There's only one problem. When that thing runs over that snake, guess what side of the mower that snake's coming out of? The side that I'm on. And, buddy, it ran over that black snake and shot it, chopped it up in about 100 pieces, shooting it right by my head, just firing right over my head. But I tell you, I was singing the hallelujah chorus as that thing was flying over my head. Because I, I hate, I hate snakes. I'm fearful of snakes. Isn't it something, we talked about it Sunday night, that the devil is pictured as a lion. What else is he pictured as? An old serpent. Aren't you thankful that the old serpent has been defeated on Calvary? That he can't affect us. Oh, he's still around and he's roaring, but, but he, he's, he's been defeated. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of Christians today that the devil has control of their life through fear and through worry, through anxiety. And when I look at these sheep lying in these green pastures, we see them, they're, they're delivered from a fretful life. So in this verse, we see there's a depiction of a restful life and the deliverance from a fretful life. And last of all, when we close, there's the demand for a trustful life. I guess the question we all have tonight as we close is this. How do we keep from worrying? We know we're not supposed to worry. We're commanded not to worry. So, so God, how can I do it? Well, how do these sheep do it? Why were these sheep lying in green pastures in the first place? Who brought them there? Psalm 23, verse 2. Listen carefully to the wording here. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth. My soul. You may see something there? Amen. This peaceful, quiet condition of the sheep were all the shepherds doing. Amen. The sheep didn't do it on their own. The shepherd did it. Yeah. How many of you know sheep are defenseless? They can't protect themselves. They're unlike any other animal. When attacked, a mule will kick. Dogs will bark and growl and bears will claw and bulls will charge. Bees will sting. Birds will flap. Snakes will strike. But sheep won't do nothing. They're absolutely defenseless. They can't defend themselves. Furthermore, they're not only defenseless, defenseless they're, they're directionless. Did you know that sheep have no sense of direction? You have pigeons, you have other birds that migrate. They have their own built-in radar system. You, you take an old cat, drop him off in the next county in a few days, he shows up purring on your front step. Believe me, I know, I've done it. Just kidding. But a sheep, but a sheep, think of this. Sheep have to be led by someone. 
right? To put it very simply, sheep are stupid. Sheep are downright dumb. Is it any wonder what God compares us to in the Bible? He compares us to sheep. And because of the kind of creature they are, there would never be a worry-free moment in their life if it were not for the shepherd. It's the shepherd that makes them lie down in green pastures. It says it right there. He maketh me lie down. He's the one who's responsible for the conditions in which they are undisturbed. All the sheep can do is trust their shepherd. You hear me? When it comes to living a worry-free life versus a worry-filled life, the secret is putting our trust in the shepherd. See, some of you are trying to get through your fearful life on your own. You can't do it. You're sheep. You have to be led. So I ask you this question as we come to a close. Do you trust the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you? That's what this all comes down to. Do you trust His guidance in your life? Can He guide the direction of your life better than you can? And on our journey from earth to glory, as we face the days that are ahead, I want you to know we can trust the shepherd. And we trust Him three ways. Give me two minutes and I'm finished. There's three ways we trust Him. We are to trust the shepherd's presence. I, I love this right here. Because it says it is He that makes them to lie down. Now, now get this. If it is He that makes them personally lie down, that means the shepherd is always at the side of the sheep. Isn't that great? The Lord is always with us. Why do you think the writer said he will never leave us or forsake us? David says it right in verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. He's always present. He's always by your side. We have the shepherd's presence. We also have the shepherd's plan. You see, he, he brings us into green pastures. See, that's, that's part of his plan for our lives. He takes us down one path and then another path, but, but we can rest knowing that he knows what he's doing and, and where he's taking us. And listen, in your life, you might cross a hill, you might come over a mountain, you might go through a valley, but his plan always includes our welfare. The shepherd always has the care of his sheep on his mind. Lastly, we can trust in the shepherd's provision. He'll see to it that there are green pastures. You know, no shepherd would ever dream of letting his sheep starve to death. The success of a shepherd is in the health of his sheep. Our Lord will take care of us no matter what we are going through. And understanding all of this, Jesus says, why do you worry? Why do you fear? Why do you fret on what you eat, drink, what to wear? What does he say? Put all those things away. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. I think about the little boy that yelled out. He said, Mommy! His mother yelled back from the kitchen, What is it, Johnny? And the little boy answered, You know that dish you were always worried about? She said, Yes, dear, what about it? He said, You don't have to worry about it anymore. <laughs> with a shepherd that's always with us, with a shepherd that's always leading us through life, meeting our every need, we ought to be able to say tonight, I don't have to worry about it anymore I have my shepherd's presence I trust my shepherd's plan and I'm resting in my shepherd's provision so from now on I'll just put my total trust in the shepherd that's why Peter could write casting all your care upon him 
for he careth for you. Let's pray. God, we love you.